large ingredient companies like a Tate and Lyle, a Cargill, um, Ingredion. So we, um, you know, again, we're kind of, you know, one of those food recyclers where it's, we're made to fit. I mean, we can come into pretty much any organization and put together a, a plan, a food recycling plan that fits their needs. Um, of course, we'd like to service everyone that produces food, but we, you know, our industry, is, as new as it is, um, still comes with challenges that we face every day. And the big challenge, I would say, is, is the packaging piece of being able to service our clients. So, so one of the issues we run into most is I might have a client that calls and is looking for food recycling. Um, and you know, one of the obvious questions I ask is, well, what type of material is it? Is it bulk? Is it packaged? We like to take bulk clean material because packaging comes with its problems and it's, it's very labor intensive. You need certain sort of uh, equipment in order to depackage package material. So again, we're just scratching the surface as many, or, I'm sorry, the surface as many clients as we do have right now, there are still so many that we're unable to service because of the packaging pieces. Um, leading me into the compost sites that we have mainly here in the Chicagoland area. So for those of you who don't know, the, the map is there. It shows you where it's located, 2000 and East 122nd Street, right off of Stony Island. Um, it used to be a landfill and, and we took this space over five or six years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and now it's uh, one of the few uh, compost sites here in the Chicagoland area. Um, the, the, the way it kind of works and I, again, you know, I'd love to be able to, and I think initially before we set this, before we entered into this whole COVID-19 pandemic, I think we were going to do a, if I'm not mistaken, Carter, we were going to do a, uh, a tour of the site. Um, and so hopefully as things open up here, uh, you know, knock on wood in the next month or two. Uh, you know, I'd love to be able to have those of you that are on this in this meeting or on the call. Uh, at some point, we could set up a a tour where you guys can actually go out and kind of get some eyes on the facility. I mean, I think you get a better understanding. Yep, yeah, there's a thank you for doing. You could just kind of Stephanie. You could just kind of go through these slides. But yeah, that's a that's a a picture. And I actually have a um, a uh, we have a flyover uh, from a drone. Uh, that I would have loved to have shared with you guys, but I, for whatever reason, I couldn't get my hands on it. But yeah, this kind of shows you um, the site itself. And just to give you, you know, for those of you that don't know a lot about composting and whatnot. So basically, the way it works is we, like I said, we service a lot of um, food manufacturers and, and retail operations throughout the, throughout the Chicagoland area that produce food. Our, our trucks come and service those locations. They bring that food waste into this facility. Um, the food waste then gets dumped up top, um, up top of the facility. It's kind of hard to, yeah, up in this area, perfect. Um, it gets dumped and it gets, it gets processed into these piles that you kind of see there to the right. Those big, uh, the, the equipment that you see there, um, are our grinders. So the material will, will be dumped into the top of those, those grinders and they'll grind up the material into fine particles. That material then gets hauled into what we call, and I don't know if the next slide shows our windrows. Yes, there you go. So those are our windrows and, and those windrows get processed um, over the course of about 12 weeks. That material gets um, gets uh, turned and processed. And then once, once it's reached a certain, I guess, uh, level of where, you know, a lot of the particles have been, you know, um, have come out of that material, it gets, it gets turned into or goes into one of our screeners. Our screeners will then screen whatever leftover contaminants are in those, those windrows. And then once it's screened, um, it's it's up it's it's sold to various uh, uh, landscapers, school districts, um, you name it. Uh, whoever's in the need for 
compost uh, we will sell it to here in the Chicago we, Chicagoland area. We actually sell it to certain clients up in Southwest um, Wisconsin. We also have some some uh, landscapers that we sell to in Northwest Michigan. So we kind of we send this material out to whoever wants it. We also have residential clients now that are calling to inquire about our compost that'll come out and they'll load up a flatbed truck full of uh, finished compost. So we have a lot of material up there, especially right now with the pandemic. Typically this is our busy year right now going into the spring, but because of everything going on, we're sitting on a lot of material right now. So trying to move this as best, best as we possibly can. Um, but that kind of gives you just a quick you know, view of the, the site up there and gives you a little idea of how the process works. Like I said, getting eyes on the facility is probably the best way for you guys to really kind of understand the process. The biggest, I guess, misnomer or the one other issue that we run into, um, so we deal a lot with clients who will call and say, hey, we have food waste that we want you guys to take in, but can you also take in compostable flatware? you know, whether it be, you know, uh, plateware, whether it be silverware or whatever. The problem that you're running into with composters like ourselves, and I see this again because we deal with compost sites throughout the country, is that a lot of places don't want to take in compostable plateware or anything compostable for that ma matter. Um, and the reason for that is just the, the, the it's, it's not biodegradable or it is biodegradable, but it takes a lot longer for this process or for this material to break down. And when we get in green waste or food waste, we want to grind that material up. We want to get it into windrows as quickly as possible. We want to process that material, screen it and get it out the door. Well, if we're bringing in a bunch of compostable, you know, plateware and all this stuff, it takes a lot longer for that stuff to break down, which kind of slows the process up a bit. So, you know, although we will take in small um, amounts of this material, we kind of frown on taking in large quantities of it. And that poses a big problem because there's a lot of organizations out there right now that are investing a lot of money in compostable plateware, silverware, and whatnot, that you know, think they're doing the right thing and they are doing the right thing. But then when it comes to companies like ours processing it and we have to turn them away, um, it's not a good thing. So, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. The other issue we run into with processing that material is that it, it puts a lot of wear and tear on our equipment. It's harder to put some of that stuff through the grinder. Um, so that tends to be another big issue in processing the compostable uh, compostable wear. We will take compostable bags, but that's about the extent of it. I mean, there are some uh, compost sites here. There's one out in the Northwest suburbs that will flat out turn away uh, trailers that come into their site with any sort of compostable wear at all. We will, like I said, take some, but in small quantities. Other places throughout the country are kind of the same way. People want to take in that material. So the majority of our, our mixture of compost is a blend of 80-20, 80% 80 green waste, 20% food waste. The green waste that we get will come from landscapers, whether it be, you know, commercial landscapers, landscapers who service various municipalities that will bring in their green waste to our sites. Republic is one of our accounts, waste management, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, and I, again, when we're, when we're able to get out to this site, I can give you guys samples of the material so you can kind of get your hands on it and whatnot. It's a very thick, um, I, a fluffy sort of material, but it's, it's meant to be a soil amendment, compost is. So, um, but yeah, that kind of gives you guys a overview of our company. It gives you a little overview of the site. Um, Whatever questions you guys might have, again, Stephanie, I don't know if you want to reserve that until the end. I can answer as best as I possibly can. Again, I think I'd mentioned this to Carter when we spoke last week. As much as I know what I need to know about compost, there's still a lot that I'm still trying to figure out as well. So if there are any questions you guys might have that I just can't answer, um, I'll, I'll be sure to write them down and make a note of it and get answers out to you folks. So. Um, but that's, that's kind of a quick overview, guys. Oops. 
Thank you, Phil. And you know, there's a, just a couple more slides of information that you shared with me. I wanted to know if you wanted to, you know, this is pretty detailed into the, uh, um, the science. Yep, exactly. That's kind of our analytics on, on the actual finished pr uh, product. Um, again, you know, as, as just stated, there's a lot that I don't know in reference to the science behind it. Um, so if there are questions specifically to, you know, the analytics on this, by all means, I'll jot them down and get you guys answers. Okay. And then the only other um, item that I think is relevant to the people here, hold on. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So is what you accept and don't accept. Um, before we move to Josh to talk about hauling, you know, the hauler does collect what they believe the facility will process. And I don't believe, you know, Lakeshore and organics are exclusively hauling and processing one another's material. But still, um, before we hear from Josh, could you tell us a little bit about just maybe anything out of the ordinary with organics list of acceptable items? And I've got that up there for everyone to see. Yeah, so this, this sheet actually, and it, this sheet gets sent out to our clients and it's different for every area that we're dealing with geographically. So as you'll see on here, acceptable materials, a lot of it is kind of obvious. Meats though and meat products are, we're fortunate because we have our own asset or our own compost site here in the Chicagoland area and we can take meats. Um, in a lot of areas, I'd say probably 60% of the areas that we service throughout the country, we're unable to take meats because either compost sites that we, we, um, we utilize don't want to take in meats. Uh, it's hard to process the smells, um, just the bacteria involved, even though they do go into windrows, they just, they don't want to, they don't want to process it. Um, so, you know, that's one of the big issues, but yeah, I mean, meat is, is again, we're fortunate that we can take that here in the Chicago land area. And then the not acceptable materials, a lot of that is what I mentioned before. I, you know, the obvious ones, you know, no glass, no plastic, no rocks, that sort of thing, metals we obviously can't take. Um, what we try to do, rather than turn away trailers that come into our site with material that's maybe not acceptable, we have sorters that are actually on site that will kind of go through the piles as they get dumped and pick out what they can. Now, if we see a trailer that dumps in 80% of that material, um, before it gets dumped, I should say, and we notice that 80% of that material is in that right column, we will have to turn the trailers away. Um, and that happens from time to time. Um, but for the most part, if there's isolated, you know, we'll call it contamination in that pile, we will have sorters kind of go through there and pick out those items and, and, and toss them out. But most of this is, again, kind of obvious, your fruits, your vegetables, cereals, grains, you know, expired food, you know, um, liquids of all kinds are acceptable, um, you know. And when I do say, just to touch on meats here in the Chicagoland area, we will take meats, but we don't want meats to be the predominant source of material. So if a trailer were to come, you know, full of expired hot dogs, uh, that could be a problem. You know, uh, we were doing some work with Vienna uh, here in the Chicagoland area, and that became an issue. Um, so, you know, we kind of like when we're taking in meats, we like it to be commingled with other food waste. So a lot of the meats that we'll get will be like corporate cafeterias that we do business with that will have plate scrappings that might have some meat on them, so on and so forth, or maybe delis that are mixing in some of their salads along with meats. That's the kind of stuff that we're looking for. But just if it's all meat, you know, we, again, we won't turn it away, but we don't want to take uh, that material for too long. Um, so, yeah, that I don't know if that Steph, Stephanie gives you a decent understanding of, you know, kind of what we're taking and what we're not taking here in Chicago. Yeah, I think that thank you very much. And there are uh, several questions that have come up. And so we will hold those until after Josh speaks, but I think it, you, by you touching on this slide really gave people kind of a lot of, a lot of thoughts. So sure. 
Perfect. So thanks everyone. Um, we're tracking uh, the questions and we'll uh, address those after Josh speaks. So thank you again, Phil, really helpful. No and problem. we're gonna go ahead and pass the baton <clears throat> to Josh. So if Phil, you wanna mute, if you've got dogs and kids or anything else. You got it. Um, and then Josh, if you're uh, good to go, I'm gonna go ahead and find you and spotlight your video. So everyone, hopefully, I don't know if it's exactly working as I hope, but hopefully everyone can be seeing you, Josh, and then seeing the slides as well. Uh, well thanks, Stephanie. And, and thank you, Phil, uh, that, that was very helpful. Um, from the collection viewpoint, we basically take direction from organics. Obviously, whatever they accept is what we want to make sure that we're accepting from our customers. Um, so a, a big part of what we do is, is education so that uh, when it gets to our transfer station facility, we don't have to sort out as many uh, contaminants. And, and so from my perspective, um, uh, the, the key for us being successful with food scrap recycling is making sure that we have good products so that organics doesn't reject anything and that they're uh, happy with the product that we're bringing them. Um, we, we do have a pretty, well, I would say it's it's very simple system, but it's, it's elaborate from my perspective. Most transfer stations, uh, the way they operate, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's, it's pretty simple with very few people. If anyone's been to some of our facilities, uh, we've got about 50 uh, laborers at every facility sorting a variety of different uh, materials. Uh, our construction demolition material is a lot easier to separate than our food scrap material. Our food scrap material is a little bit dirtier. Uh, we do a floor sort and uh, with our floor sort we're basically pulling out uh, any contaminants that we know organics doesn't want. Uh, the largest contaminant that we get is really the plastics. Uh, we don't know if it's uh, a plastic a rigid plastic or is it a compostable plastic and that, that makes it very challenging for us uh, and then we pull out other items uh, we, we will get a lot of um, large shipments from vegetable producers and uh, fruit fruit distribu uh, distributors here's a picture here of uh, I think it's broccoli that we've got there could be Brussels sprouts but I think it's uh, just expired uh, broccoli so this this is uh, material that a, a, a large distributor felt that they couldn't put on a shelf somewhere. Um, when we received it, it was all boxed up. And so we'll break down the boxes, recycle the, the, the corrugated, and then uh, in many cases, this stuff will even be in, in plastic crates as well. When we get uh, fruits and vegetables, we'll often have the fruits uh, that are in, uh, in, in plastic and we've got to separate it. Uh, you can see the, the, the remnants of all the boxes there that we broke down. And then uh, we start creating a pile of just organic material that we will load up into a uh, hundred yard trailer. And uh, depending on our volume, uh, we can, in the summer months, we might ship a hundred yard trailer every other day. Um, in the winter months, it could be a 100 yard trailer every couple of weeks, maybe. But, uh, but that's how we receive the bulk of our approximate hundred tons a day of organic material during the summer months. Uh, a lot of it is uh, containerized in uh, crates and boxes. Um, and then some of the contaminants that we get uh, from our collection route is uh, it's bagged material. You can see some of those compostable bags that we've got there uh, and just loose material. So again, not easy to sort, uh, can be very difficult. Our, unfortunately, our employees, we've trained them properly. We've got about three or four individuals that uh, are on this duty every single day and they know what to look for, they know what to pull out. Um, they're doing it with rakes and uh, shovels and, uh, and by hand and uh, so that we can, we can have a good product that we send to organics. So that's really it from my perspective. Um, again, education's probably the key for us. Uh, in this picture here, you can see a load of brick in concrete and in the back is our organics pile there where we'll mix the uh, food scrap material with um, uh, other organic material, which could be leaf, uh, you know, leaves and grass and mulch and, and various other products that we're collecting with uh, our yard waste routes. So that's all, all I've got. Stephanie? Um, all right. Well, it, it sounds brief, but the fact is that it's just the piece that touches all of us, you know? I mean, a lot of times we don't have the, the luxury of, of having Phil or someone from Organics, um, you know, 
a phone call away. And so the phone calls come to Josh and come to Lakeshore. And a lot of the questions that um, have been mentioned here probably would be ones that, um, that come to you. So I guess my, my, my first question for you, or something I'd like you to kind of mention is, how do you manage as a hauler who is bringing material to organics, who is setting their own recipe? You know, how do you manage the communication for what's acceptable through your stream, knowing that A, organics isn't the only processor receiving it, but also, um, you know, there's only so much meat they can take or whatever. And so how, um, how, how do you maintain accuracy in what your customers can expect from you? Uh, do you have a close um, communication or, you know, weekly, monthly conversations with organics and the other processors? Or, you know, how, how do you manage what you know so you tell your customers what they need to know? No, it's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, through the uh, Illinois Food Scrap Coalition, I do keep in touch with uh, what's going on within the industry. Uh, for example, a good example is the uh, compostable uh, placeware. Uh, we, we accepted that years ago when we started uh, running our, uh, our collection route. And uh, the more feedback we were getting from processors was that they just don't know what it is. And then even when it is compostable, uh, it may break down. Um, you know, eventually, but it's not breaking down at the same rate of the other or, uh, food scrap and, and or other organic material. And so that was something that we took off our list pretty quickly um, just to make it easier. Uh, with with the, the meat, I, I think, um, yeah, we've got some of the, our uh, the facilities we utilize, especially up in the north suburbs, will take it. Some don't. But I think Phil's answer was perfect. You know, on, on very small quantities, we're taking it. We really don't have any uh, meat processors that we deal with. It might just be um, a little bit here and there that uh, that we get from some of our customers, but none of our large restaurants with heavy volume, uh, we're we're basically just getting their fruits and vegetables, um, and, and we've made it clear that we want very little meat product in in the food scrap material. I hope that helps. Um, thank you for sharing that. And if there's nothing else specific that you want to add right now. Um, I will uh, let everyone know about the slide that's on the screen now, and then we'll go ahead and move to questions. So um, I wanted to bring this up. I am, you know, full disclosure, on the board of the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition and on the Communications and Outreach Committee with Josh and uh, anyone else who's willing to help. And that includes uh, many people on this call, Amy DiLorenzo and Liz with um, Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. They're both involved with University of Illinois and UIC. So um, everyone who's involved in Illinois Food Scrap Coalition does a great job of volunteering their support. And part of what else happens is um, we benefit from the resources that others have created. And so on the IllinoisCompost.org website, which is the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition website, there's tons of information that relates to residents, relates to municipalities, policymakers, um, lots, lots of different things, and you can check it out yourself. But these two uh, documents that I've highlighted here were actually both created by um, solid waste agencies. The Solid Waste Agency of Lake County created this residential food scrap composting program doc that I'll describe in a minute. And uh, it's actually Will County is where Joan works and provided this Family Earth Day one sheet, how to build your own compost bin. And uh, you know we bring these examples up now because the conversation is focused on commercial and large scale. And um, though that is the you know, CSTF in a nutshell, we also are all residents of Chicago or the suburbs. And if we're mindful at home with managing material and, and you, you know, wanna take it on ourselves or wanna know how best to ensure that we're following the procedures to keep the stream clean in our residential program, these are two easy tools to, to get those answers. So I'm not gonna read them to you, but they're there. And they will, um, the kind of post meeting, uh, slides and, and minutes will be provided to everybody who registered. So, um, and then hopefully you'll be talking directly, maybe chatting with either Laura or Katie if they don't have 
the information to know who you are, but we want to make sure that these materials and links um, and references are shared after this. So um, Illinois Food Scrap Coalition, follow us on Facebook, like us on Instagram, Twitter, all the above, and you can learn through these docs. So again, we're now moving to the open discussion. This is just a reminder of how to engage in the chats. And um, if you type the word stack, will be noted that you want to speak up. But again, this is an open discussion and you can feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and politely interrupt. Um, Josh, I like your, your backgrounds. So with, <laughs> with that, I'm going to close the screen here. I'll, I'll open that doc up later, but I'm gonna stop the sharing, stop the madness. And so now we'll move on to questions. And number one, um, this relates to the serveware and I'll kind of, because there was a few different questions, I do want to mention that, you know, all, all the, a lot of work that I've done myself and a lot of us involved, we understand that compostable food serviceware has a value. The value in part is bringing a higher volume of food scraps to the compost facility because it's easier to bring it along than try to separate. And especially when you're relying on front of house collection, um, if you have polystyrene or something like that, you not only are dealing with worse contamination of the compost facility, but you have to deal with all the negative life cycle issues that go along with you know, the benzene, all, just all the bad things that come out of the production. Um, and then the fact that that plastic's gonna be here forever and you know, I don't need to go on about plastic pollution. So just understanding that um, biodegradable and compostable serveware is an alternative, a lot of people see, see value in it. Um, you mentioned challenges, Phil, about time in terms of processing, wear and tear on machinery. And so it would seem like understanding what small quantities are would be great so that in Chicago we have a sense of you know, how much is an allowable quantity? I don't mean in our bin, because, you know, you always tell everybody zero tolerance because the tolerance is so small that if everyone does a little bit, it'll hopefully be within your minuscule threshold. So, but if you can help us understand the compostable serveware that is coming in, you know, um, and how, just kind of how you define that in terms of percentages and amounts. I mean, if we have a, call it a 52 foot trailer that comes in to our site to dump food waste and 10% of that trailer is full of, you know, we'll call it compostable ware, whatever that, however you want to categorize that. Um, that's a small percentage. I'd say to, to, to give, to use, just use percentages, I would say typically no more than 10% of whatever load comes in, um, we will be okay with it. Anything usually over 10%, the site manager there uh, is going to inspect it pretty hard. And, you know, um, if, as I said earlier, if we can go through it and our pickers can go through there and our sorters can go through there and uh, within a short period of time kind of remove some stuff, they'll, they'll still keep, you know, they'll, they'll service the load. But um, again, you know, it, it Typically, anything over 10%, they're going to turn it away. Um, you know, and, and the other problem that I didn't mention, you know, because we sell our product, right? So after the material gets screened, you know, and the screener does a pretty good job of getting rid of um, the majority of contamination, but, but there are still plastics and whatnot that sometimes don't that get past the screener. So then when we send an outbound load of finished compost to one of our commercial landscapers and they call us and say, hey, by the way, we found a fork or we found plastic, shards of plastic in the finished product, that doesn't bode well for us, right? And it can affect, you know, um, the sale of our material. Um, Scott's is one of our clients up in Wisconsin. So as you can imagine, you know, you know, they, if they get a load of material and there's, you know, you know, contamination in that material, um, you know, we potentially lose a client. So that's why we are, 
you know, very strict and stringent on, you know, uh, that contamination that goes into these loads. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and start at the top and share some additional questions. Um, as Loyola is a Lakeshore Recycling client with organics, if they have an item that they're adding or uncertain about, call it a bin liner, bioplastic, fiber-based, and they reach out to the account manager and they advise if we should use it or push it to a non-compostable stream. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it sort of sounds like multiple questions. I'm sorry, that was a little bit confusing. Um, but the, I guess the question is, if they're um, supposed to reach out to an account manager at the hauler in order to determine if a specific item is acceptable or not. And that's, I guess, a question for either of you. I think- Yeah, I mean, we- Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, we, we get those calls all the time and, and we reach out. Um, I know I've contacted uh, Rick Shipley uh, at Organics often. I know our account managers uh, will contact our, our team, which probably reach out uh, to someone over there at Organics uh, throughout the year. But we get those on a regular basis. Yeah, and I think typically you then, Josh, would just contact us and ask, hey, are you guys going to take this or are you not going to take it, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of how it works. Yeah, Stephanie, this is Aaron. That was more of a comment than a question, just the way it's worked successfully for us. Well, then there you go. It all, all three of you guys are on the same page, which is perfect. Um, we had a separate question that relates to what level of compostable PLA cups are acceptable. Yeah, I, I mean, <sighs> And we had a, uh, a situation, I think I mentioned it to Carter last week, um, where the Chicago Marathon um, had a sizable amount of um, compostable cups that they wanted us to take. And, and um, by sizable, and I can't remember the numbers, but it was, as you can imagine, you know, with as many people that run in the marathon and whatnot, it was a lot. Um, so in that particular case, we just, we couldn't, as I mentioned before, we're not, we're not gonna take that type of material, even if it's compostable, if that's the predominant source of material. If, if, if we were able to, we could, we could take compostable cups if they're commingled with food, as I mentioned before. So I know I'm probably being somewhat evasive on how I answer that, that question, but, um, it, there's really no acceptable level of volume. I guess it's just as long as as long as it's not your predominant volume, if that makes sense. So as long as it's mixed in with other with food waste, there's a good chance we'll be okay taking it. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, we have another question that relates to the. Um, classification or certification. So regarding compostable plastics versus more fiber-based products that are more closely resembling paper, um, is, is, that, uh, is that an issue? Because I think you're saying that it's not PLA, but the marathon cups were fiber-based. So either are uh, something that must be limited well, and I see on there, you know, BPI, you know, yes, if it's BPI certified, obviously that helps, um, you know, um, we'll only take in, you know, BPI certified compostable wear, uh, material. Um, again, you know, if I had, so Pat Riley is the guy that runs our site at Harborview. And if he were on this call, uh, and I love Pat, but he would tell you, I don't want to take any of it. That's, that would be his answer. I don't want to take any compostable where I don't care if it's BPI certified, I, you know, I, I don't want to take it um, because he's the guy that has to deal with it, right? He's the guy that has to process it and put it through the grinder and all those things. So um, again, you know, and I sound like a broken record, you know, we don't turn it away and Josh will, will, will um, as he mentioned before, I mean, he knows that we'll take in some of their loads that have compostable wear in it. It's just, again, smaller percentages. So again, I, I know I'm maybe not giving you specifics. No. But, you We're know, just being asked questions and answering. There's yeah. no you know, yeah. problem. 
Um, so in regards to managing uh, the material, someone wondered if a section of the facility could be could be set aside or dedicated to managing some of these uh, materials that, you know, dedicated PLA material was, was the way Mary Beth um, stated it, but understanding if, if that could be separated at the facility, but still processed maybe at a slower pace. I suppose it could, it just becomes, as you can imagine, very labor intensive. I mean, if you're bringing in trailers, so if you open the floodgates, let's just say, to start taking in compostable ware, whatever that may be, whether it be cups, whether it be plates, you know, whatnot, um, you know, you're gonna get a lot of material and it's gonna take a lot of people to kind of process that and sort through it. And so, you know, um, Hey, for me, because I get paid by the ton, I would love to say, yes, bring in as much as you can. But, I, you know, again, it's we have to have the manpower to be able to, to manage that. And in theory, the question is, yeah, could we section off a, an area uh, on site where we could have people going through that and processing it and whatnot? Um, yes, it could be done, but we haven't gone down that road. Okay. All right. And uh, so staying on the topic of serveware for just a couple more minutes because there was several questions. So is the problem how long it takes these materials to break down or is it the risk of accepting non-compostable contaminants? I think, I think the main is the first one. It's just the time that it takes for this to, to, to you know, to be, uh, to break down. Um, and then the second piece of it, you know, again is, the, the wear and tear on the material on the the equipment on site that's the big one okay all right and then do, do uh, uncoated 100 percent paper plates and napkins um are those managed uh differently than the rest of the organic material napkins napkins usually i mean i have an account where they um you know they have uh we take a lot of napkins from them, but again, they have food waste that we take as well. So napkins aren't as big of an issue because it's easier to work with. Um, as far as the plate wear goes, I mean, again, it's paper. Um, you know, we will take it. It's just in, you know, in 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 smaller smaller quantities. Um, you know, if 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 the driver comes, as I mentioned earlier, and dumps his trailer and the whole trailer is full of paper napkins and paper plates, that's gonna be a problem. So um, again, just we'll do it in smaller quantities. Okay. Um, we were notified by Kat at the Chicago Marathon. She, she mentioned here in the chat that the organic waste was 16 tons, nine uh -huh. tons of cups and seven tons of food scraps. Yeah, I think I think Kat. I spoke. I think I did speak to Kat. That's, yep, that Kat. is exactly for sure. For sure, yeah. she, shared, you know, she shared her her you know journey of getting those composted. I also yeah. took part in it when April was over there, so I'm familiar. Yeah, uh, I did go through that process because I did want to. I think Kat actually had a good idea too, where it was like, hey, could we maybe stagger loads of this stuff? Where you know we just. And I went down, you know, both a couple different avenues to try to accommodate that, but I can only do so much. I mean, again, I have to go through, you know, the, the site manager, as I mentioned, and then it has to, that, those types of loads have to be approved by the people on site, but then also like Josh mentioned, our CEO, Rick Shipley, you know, has to get involved in those situations and um, if they tell me no, unfortunately, there's not much I can do, but yeah, sorry, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a question about how other cities and, you know, other facilities like in San Francisco or places where there's an increased uh, quantity of compostable serveware, uh, if that might be something that we're going to expect down the road, uh, might there be you know, thoughts on that and preparation um, to, to, to be able to accept and manage that material or, or not? I suppose there could be here in the Chicagoland area. Um, not as familiar with, with San Francisco, but what I can tell you guys, because as mentioned earlier, I deal with a lot of different compost, 
compost sites throughout the country. Um, and the large consensus is they don't want to take any compostable material. I mean, they're, you know, and those that will take small percentages of it, um, their rates or their tip fees are really high. So, you know, the whole idea in going compost is not only be doing something better for the environment um, and, and divert this material from landfill to compost sites, but to also see maybe a cost benefit, wherein in some cases, um, you have compost sites that will take this material, but their costs are higher than landfill. So that's the other challenge you run into. Yeah, yeah, understood. Um, have, have you, this is probably the last question that's specifically related to processing, Phil. Um, yeah. Have you performed any testing of compostable items with the Compost Manufacturing Alliance? Typically what will happen is if we have a customer that says, hey, we've, um, you know, we have moved to this sort of compostable plateware. You know, there's one out there called VeggieWare. Um, that one is probably one that we have. We haven't run our own tests on it. Typically, the client will provide us information that they've done on their end, um, analytics of some sort that we'll go through. Um, you know, our site manager will review it with people at our organization, and they'll, you know, either give the thumbs up or thumbs down. So to answer your question, no, we don't, we don't do any sort of analysis on that material. We usually, the client usually has uh, information that they provide us with, and then we make the decision based off of what they give us. Understood. Okay. And I know uh, earlier in the chat, Wendell um, from BPI had, had mentioned that the U.S. Composting Council, through their Research and Education Foundation, CCREF, CREF has a field test program um, where 12 weeks they've shown and they've got some, some uh, uh, sorry, they've, they've got something on their website, which we'll be able to share that will show you uh, this material breaking down in 12 weeks. Obviously it depends on conditions. I know that um, we had eco products send materials to Midwest Organics up in uh, Lake County prior to us creating a program where the hauler could take material there, we wanted to ensure that we knew what should be on that acceptable list, which to me is just the way you do it, is right. you make sure what can happen before you tell people it can. And, um, and in that facility, uh, which is an enormous facility with a lot of pace, a lot of space to have column, you know, windrows that are specifically focused on you know, they, they could keep an eye on those windrows and see what happened. And the long and short of it was the eco products items disappeared. Mm. You know, that that's one brand that was packed. They did keep it kind of stacked so that it would mimic what it would look like, where a lot of the cups, some of them were stacked together. Things were kind of bulked up because that's how it would be in a bag. And, sure. you know, so at least there are examples out there in the Chicagoland area and I don't know if organics has enough space that it can dedicate, um, you know, trials, space for trials like that. But if so, Phil, if that's something Pat would even consider, I know that there's people involved on this call that maybe would, uh, would be able to help support that. Sure. No, absolutely. So, um, and uh, I want to move on to the finished product because that's something that was brought up even before the, uh, the, event or the call. Um, it is, how do we, where is this now? Sorry, it got dropped down. Where do we buy it? How do we buy your finished product? I mean, that's the long and short. How can we, people on the call or people who are asking, you know, let's say it's the landscapers at Loyola. Just throwing it out there, Aaron. Um, yeah. How do they buy your product? Yeah, and unfortunately, we don't really have any sort of advertising or marketing marketing that we do on a regular basis to sell our product. A lot of it is word of mouth. A lot of it is just reaching out to folks on our end. Um, you know, as I mentioned, landscapers are probably our biggest target market um, for this material. Um, you know, and like I said, again, in the Chicagoland area, most of the outbound loads that we sell are through just somebody heard about us. Um, 
So yeah, and as far as you know, how say one of you guys on our call wanted compost or whatnot, um, it's as easy as really coming out to our site. And you know, we we don't get a lot of residential uh, customers, you know, that are coming out there to load up a, you know, a trailer just full of compost. Not adverse to it, and we have had people come out there and do that. But it's such a large industrial site that it's kind of hard to service those types of clients. Most of the clients that we have are going to be, like I said, you know, we've done some work with um, Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, we've done some work with the Indiana. Uh, road, uh, Department of Transportation, school districts, uh, those types of things. And again, Stephanie, a lot of it is just word of mouth. Okay. And I'm getting some notes here that it sounds like the haulers that work with you also provide it back to their customers. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, they will. So they'll maybe do a, you know, uh, they'll do a, a drop a load of green waste and then we'll load their trailer up with finished screened product that they'll take back to their clients. Got it. Okay. We deliver as well. Um, you know, so as I mentioned, I mean, we have, you know, trailers that, and most of what goes out of our site is organics delivering to their clients. We do have some bigger landscapers that will come in and uh, we'll, we'll load their trailers up, but most of what goes out is, is going out on an organics trailer. Got it. Got it. Yes. So um, here's a question. Uh, if you cannot take a load, where is it usually sent? So if we, if we turn away a load, then it's got to go, it will go to landfill. Okay. And would that be, that would happen at your facility, Josh? What happens, uh, you know, I'm assuming the same thing, but what happens if your drivers, well, kind of walk us through that how your drivers manage contamination that's seen at any point in the process? Well, when it's seen, uh, we're, I mean, our driver's flagging it, calling our dispatcher, and we're dumping it as garbage uh, the next day. Um, when it's seen, it's not always easy to see. Sometimes it's at the bottom of the container and you don't see it till it's in the truck. At that point, uh, that, that's part of our, our process where we go through the material at our transfer station. And do you have any rough numbers on, you know, you've got a route truck and it's picking up material from, from lots of uh, clients and you don't, it isn't seen until it gets to your, your mm -hmm. shipping floor. Um, you know, what percentage are you having to pull out, would you say, on average? Um, I, last number I heard, and this is a number from last summer, was about 20% contamination. Okay. And when it, this might be a silly question, but when you clear out that 20%, mm -hmm. is, that, is that at 100% clean or at that point it's within the 10% threshold probably? I, I would say we're well within the 10%. Phil, if, he, if he's looked at some of our loads, he could probably give us a better idea. But uh, from my understanding with our team is we're well within the, uh, the 10% at that point. Awesome. Okay. Uh, that's it just, you know, I'm just going to speak on my own opinion right now, but Lakeshore is providing a service that we all need in order to work with organics. So, so thank you for that. Because if you weren't, uh, if your company wasn't helping to keep these loads clean, then a lot of our front of house, um, composting programs couldn't exist. So, um, this, I love this question. Thank you, Brianna. How would Phil and Josh, um, we'll start with Phil, how would both of you or either of you completely redesign the waste system to make it more efficient? Uh, <laughs> how, would, how would I completely redesign the waste system to, as it pertains to food waste? Is that, okay. You know, I'm gonna leave it as open-ended as she did. Uh, I mean, I've got some thoughts uh, from uh, our, from our transfer station perspective, we've talked about having a, instead of a floor sort, we've talked about having like an assembly line like we do other commodities where we can more efficiently and effectively clean the loads uh, to make them better. Now that's at the facility perspective. From a collection perspective, I, I still think we need legislation. If we wanna really make a difference and really collect more material, 
Uh, we have to have legislation like they have in uh, the San Francisco area, Seattle area. Um, now, I don't know if that's part of that question as to, you know, redesigning the system, but without legislation, it's going to be hard because economically, it doesn't work. It's more expensive for us to collect uh, compostable material, uh, organic material, than it is to collect garbage right now. And the biggest reason is the landfill rates are significantly cheaper here in the Midwest than they are in the East and West Coast, where they have more success with, uh, with organic material. And uh, we need route density. We need uh, other factors that will help us collect uh, organic material more efficiently. And without legislation, we're, we're, we're not going to have it. It's, it's going to be consumers that want to do the right thing and, um, uh, or those with significantly high volumes that can maybe make it work economically. That's just my opinion. I think, I think it's yeah. an educated opinion. I think you're right on with that, Josh. I think, you know, if you do like out East right now, like in Connecticut, um, parts of New Jersey and New York, various municipalities are making it a requirement that, you know, different organizations that produce a certain tonnage, a monthly tonnage of food waste are required, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to start diverting that material um, from landfill. Um, but again, and they're enforcing this, whereas that hasn't happened, as Josh mentioned, here in the Midwest and other parts of the country. I think the other thing that I mentioned earlier that is a huge challenge for us in the way of being able to process as much food waste as we can is just the packaging piece of it. A lot of companies want to compost. They want you to take their food waste. They don't necessarily want it to go to landfill, but they don't want to unpackage the material on that. It's just too cost, it's too labor intensive. And that's where it becomes a huge challenge. I mean, there have been a number of clients that I go and I, I, I walk their facility and I see the amount of food waste that they have and it's all packaged material and there's nothing we can really do for them. And that happens more often than not, so. Um, I want to touch back on that point and then go back to something Josh said. So in terms of the that issue of packaging, if packaging was taken out of the equation, and I, I'm thinking about the compostable serveware, since that was the chat piece mentioned, if that was taken out of the equation, how much more food waste could you potentially accept? If the, if the packaging piece was taken out of the equation, I mean, yeah. gosh, you know, just a, uh, if I had to give you a percentage, I mean, I would say for every five clients I go to see, I can maybe service one of them. And the other four clients I can't service because they have either too, most, too much compostable wear or they just have, you know, too much material that's packaged. Okay, so you're saying that you can't deal with a lot of clients. One in, let's, one in five can't? One in five cannot be serviced because of their. For, I, I, four, four out of the five, I'm sorry, I should have said it differently. Four out of the five, I can't service because okay. their material is just, unfortunately, I, I, can't, I can't service it because of how it's packaged, but that it is packaged. Okay, okay. And I think we're glad, just to be clear, we're talking about compostable serveware. We're not talking about crates of apples. Oh, okay. Okay, so you had two different. I was looking at it more from like food manufacturers and whatnot. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I would say probably <clears throat> doing the numbers again half. So if I had if I had four clients, two I could probably service. The other two, I I wouldn't be able to because the other <clears throat> the other couple would want me to take all of their compostable wear. That's all they have, and I can't do that. So um, it's trying to find. <clears throat> those clients that have a nice mix of both compostable wear and food waste. Those that's, that's kind of our sweet spot. Of course, of course. Um, so then I'm going to, well, I guess, Josh, I'm going to go back to your legislation piece, but, but just to stay on this, because we had probably three other questions that I didn't get to related to um, the, the compostables, the companies that are producing compostable serveware, you know, has the cart come before the horse is the question that Kate asked here. And wondering, uh, as many food service companies 
have commitments to divert 100% of waste from landfills, how will this affect more compostable flatware in the system? I, I think, you know, the, the one thing I'll say is I think there's this, and I, and, and I mentioned it in my initial presentation, there's this misconception that companies think, okay, we're switching over. And, and, and with all due respect, it's a great thing that companies want to switch from, you know, just their standard, whatever they're using today to compostable wear. But I think there's this, this misconception that if we switch to compostable wear, that compost sites are just going to be able to arbitrarily take all of this material. And that's where the issue is. There's just it's lack of education. Um, and I think that's where the problem, I mean, you know, what's really frustrating our iron is, is we're kind of the messenger, you know, so we have a client that will contact us and say, okay, we're ready for to start sending you guys material. And then we see what the material is and we say, I'm sorry, we can't take this. And they're like, well, wait a second. We've spent all this money on compostable wear and you're telling us you can't take it. And it can turn into kind of a heated discussion from time to time, right? Um, but again, a lot of that I think is, you know, educating folks on, you know, this situation and realizing that, hey, just because you're switching to compostable wear doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, whatever local compost site that's in your particular area is going to take this material. That's where the problem is. I don't know, Josh, if you agree with that or, you know, have anything more to add. Josh is muted. Oh, um, so yeah, I'm not sure if he caught that last bit, but I think you're very right that it is, um, you know, it's hard because everyone wants, it's like wish cycling, you know, everyone wants it to not go in the landfill and is trying to do the right thing. So I, I do know it's, it's a common frustration, um, but we ultimately need to work within your confines in order for you to support us. So yeah, you know, <clears throat> what would be great is again, you mentioned the cart before the horse. What would be great really are for companies that are looking to, you know, invest the money in compostable wear and all that is that they reach out to the compost site first, you know, and just say, Hey, we're looking at, and I've had that happen where I've had like a corporate cafeteria, um, you know, for some bit large organization that will contact me or contact our site and say, hey, we're looking at switching over. Is this going to be a problem? And we kind of talk it through. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, probably the first step is just making sure, you know, these organizations are reaching out to their local compost sites to make sure that before they invest the money that, you know, they're going to have a home for this stuff. Okay. Um, Josh, were you able to pipe in now? I missed a lot of that. I don't know what happened to the volume. It just yeah. left. So, but I saw Phil's mouth moving. His mouth moved so. a lot. He, um, he shared a lot of insight on the challenges associated with, uh, you know, people buying more compostable serveware. The question was, did we put the cart before the horse having all these manufacturers of serveware? Um, get us ahead, you know, away from plastic, but then leave us in a position where we have material that our facilities can't process. And, you know, comments, many comments were, were made. Um, if you want to comment on that, and then I want to go back to legislation, which was another thing we were, we were talking about, Num namely landfill tipping fees. I don't know if you were going to bring that up, but it's a common one. Yeah, I mean, tipping fees are hurting, uh, I, I think, our, our push to recycle more organic material because they're so cheap in the Midwest, like I said earlier. Um, and, and don't get me started on uh, consumer packaging because I struggle with it on the single stream recycling, uh, and I struggle with it also on the, the compostable side, too. Um, but again, something's got to come first. So, you know, maybe we'll see some ingenuity based on the products that we have out there in the market. but. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of mixed messages. There's a lot of products that say they're recyclable, uh, but they're not, or they might be recyclable, but they're really hard to, uh, to sort out a, at, at a facility level. So um, the idea of compostable uh, uh, items, uh, it, it, it's attractive to me, but again, you know, companies like Phil's have to be able to accept it, deal with it, 
and it's got to break down in a, in a reasonable amount of time. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's going to hurt his process of making a good product. Right. Um, there was a question that could equipment be changed? Could we have better grinding, you know, better grinding equipment to handle this material we're talking about? I was, I was just going to say, I mean, there are the packagers out there. They're, they're very expensive. Um, and, you know, I don't know a lot about, you know, what their capabilities are. I know that there are some out there um, that, you know, will do a pretty good job. But again, um, our company doesn't, we haven't invested the money in a depackager de per se. I've, I've actually, there's a depackager that I, one of my, uh, there's a site out in Pennsylvania, um, Hermosa, Pennsylvania, that I went and I, I visited and saw their depackager. And they'll depackage everything from glass to things that are in glass to plastics to um, whatnot. But again, um, it's not an exact science and they still have their struggles. Um, so yes, there could be some advancements in equipment. It's, it's, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that are in the works right now, uh, but it's then finding companies like an organics or whatnot that want to put the capital up to invest in those, in, in those types of, uh, in that type of machinery. So. Yeah, there's some amazing machinery. I, Nora, I don't know if she's still on the call from BioCycle. Um, I have learned a lot from her and then also seen some amazing, amazing things from the folks in New York City. So yeah. they came out here and looked at the anaerobic digester, actually, Josh, when you purchased that. Um, so uh, questions from schools, you know, who are, have purchased this compostable serveware, uh, plates, namely, wanting to know what does this mean? You know, what percentage of their material is acceptable? So in those cases, you'd almost want to do like a waste analysis. You'd almost want them to start tracking um, what goes, you know, what percentage of material, you know, compostable plateware, silver or whatnot, what percentage of that would be going into our containers, let's just say, or just containers. Um, and, and, and kind of do an analysis to figure out what percentage is going to be food and what percentage is then going to be, you know, compostable trays or, or, or what other, whatever other stuff the school district is using. And we're talking like 10% by weight is sort of what you mentioned. Yeah, typically that's going to be, you know, um, they want to see a nice mixture of both, you know, at the can sounding redundant, but that's kind of what they're looking for. Okay, it answers the question that they had. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and I do think that um, it, it's worth noting because a couple people mentioned petrochemicals, you know, and just understanding that, you know, it's, it's important to compost compostable serveware, but there's a bigger issue and, and reusables and education around that is very important. Uh, getting away from plastic use and Carter pasted uh, a report that will be in the meeting minutes too that is worth a read I'm clearly not reading it right now and then also you know how can we further education around backyard composting and vermicomposting so really understanding that we can take this on ourselves it's not all just on you know fill get better equipment um, it, it's not just you you know but but no, the, I know what you mean. the question yeah. is you know what more can be done so I'm going to take a look through the questions that have been raised to make sure that, ooh, there was one good one. Um, I'm going to ask this last question and then glance through my notes. And once I'm done, I would encourage people to uh, open their mics and um, speak up yourself. Uh, but, but this question, is there a reason why haulers can't or won't share their vendors uh, with their vendors for diversion um, with customers. So like if I am hiring a hauler and they're taking the material somewhere, why can't I know who they're working with? They can as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I don't have an issue if, if we're, I mean, if we're servicing a client, uh, they know that that material, uh, you tip, typically one of the first questions they ask is, where is this stuff going? You know, so I, I'm, we're very transparent on that. 
Okay, if that answers the question from the person who asked it or feel free to speak up now and clarify, maybe, maybe I didn't answer the question right. Aaron, sorry to put you on the spot, but what, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> well, uh, I've just heard of other uh, colleagues, other institutions where their hauler won't provide that transparency. We have Lakeshore as a hauler and they provide us a list. And like I said before, if we have questions about a product and it's compostability, recyclability, whatever it is, we can get a response. But I've heard that that isn't always the case. And I was wondering if there was a market reason why that information maybe can't, won't, shouldn't be shared. Um, I heard, you know, a, a no from the two presenters, but obviously they're, um, they might be the exception. Oh, the only thing I can think is if you have some, a hauler that doesn't want to share where that material is going is maybe the hauler is concerned that that client, if they know where the material is going, that they might reach out to the end site themselves to, to see if maybe that, site does hauling on their end and just cut out the middleman that that would be the only thing i could think of josh i don't know if you want to weigh in on that. yeah that that's a good point that's the only thing i could think of um you know part of the reason i started a company 20 years ago though was just uh, sometimes certain companies just like to have their own little trade secrets and uh that's just part of it too doesn't always make sense but um you know but but i get that often too that's not the first time i've heard that being an issue. Thank you. Um, there, I'm going to bring up, uh, go back to the legislation because I didn't go back to it like I wanted. And uh, Josh, you brought up the point that um, I, I still really love that Brianna asked the question, you know, what would you guys change? And um, when it comes to legislation, we talked a little bit about landfill tipping fees, which may or may not have been where your mind was going. Um, but tell us a little more, Josh, your thoughts and anyone else's, if there are legislative solutions, potential solutions to the problems or the challenges that we have in Chicago and Illinois, um, what would be some ideas to solve those? Well, we saw this take place, I think it was in 2005, the city of Chicago came out with a construction and recycling, um, diversion uh, ordinance, which required, I think initially it required 50% diversion of recycled products, and then they moved it up um, over the years. Uh, but just, you know, if we had that same requirement, uh, start with grocery stores where it's simple, or, or restaurants of a certain size where they have to divert, you know, 20 you know, percent of their food scrap material, uh, that's where I, I think we'd, we'd have a, a big benefit, and it would be a catalyst to having more uh, infrastructure in the marketplace and reducing the, the cost structure for uh, you know, the, the collection companies like myself because we could have more density of, of customers and, uh, and we could put a little bit more capital into the program because we know that it's, it's gonna stick around. Um, but when you just you know, leave it uh, to you know, pure economics at play uh, and, and the spirit of people that wanna recycle, it, it's very difficult. Um, but I, I know you've got some communities that are, are not necessarily making an ordinance, but making it part of their uh, commercial franchise uh, with uh, Evanston. And I know Skokie's looking to do it. And uh, I think with Collective Resource, I think they're on the, the call here. Uh, I think it helps because then it, it gives them the ability to, to have a good cost structure to provide a service across a broad base of, of businesses in one community, at least. If we did that throughout the region or throughout the state, I think we'd find the same success. Those, those are also, you know, uh, ideas and, and, you know, programs taking place throughout the country. So I think you're right on point, Josh. Um, you know, there was a question raised, uh, if incentive-based or regulatory or both is the answer. And again, this is open discussion. So I want to hear from Josh and Phil, but everyone is welcome. You know, we've got so many people who are chiming in here who, you know, Midwest Foods is an enormous composter. They are an enormous 
produce distributor and are composting a lot. Mary Allen knows more about school composting than anyone in the world. So, so everyone feel free to speak up, but, but Josh, what do you think, regulatory or incentive-based or a combination? It's tough to be incentive-based um, with the economics that we've got at play, but, um, but I think legislation would help drive the cost down. Um, and again, I think if it's simple, especially for the large providers like the grocery stores starting there and, and working in more uh, industry over time, I, I think legislation's the way to go. Um, when there's more infrastructure, I think there, there could be some in incentives as well. Um, the biggest incentive would be is if it could be a, a cheaper uh, price point than we have uh, for garbage and recycling. Um, but at the same time, I don't know the back end of the industry as well that, that Phil knows as far as the, the finished product. I know with our aerobic digester or anaerobic digester, we, we struggled with some finished product. Um, we were competing with the MWRD with their finished product that they were giving away for free. Um, are there enough outlets too for all this finished product? That, that's one part of the, uh, the, uh, the loop here that we've got to close too is, you know, Phil, do you have enough, you know, if you can make more, you know, double your capacity, would you have enough consumers to purchase it? Well, that's, that's a challenge. I mean, that's a challenge, especially even right now that we're faced with, I think I mentioned earlier, is we're sitting on a lot of finished screened compost right now that we just, we need to move, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think if we were, to, we did have more space and I know they've talked about expanding that area up there, um, but yeah, I. I don't know that we'd be able to, uh, to, to, to have enough outlets that would take the material. Um, you know, again, that, I, I really don't know the answer to that question, but um, yeah. Um, but it's a tough one in, in this marketplace. Um, you know, we're not like California that's year round um, right. consumers of, of the finished product. Um, and I haven't followed enough in New York or some other uh, Northeast uh, communities to know what they do on a year round basis. But I think if there's legislation, we could get the state and other local governments involved as well for buying that finished product. Yeah, and that's a good point, Josh. I mean, pretty much from November until about March, uh, there are no outbound loads of compost going out of that site. Um, and and the, the issue is, is, you know, loads aren't going out, but we're still taking in a lot of food waste, obviously, that doesn't stop. Um, not taking in as much green waste then either, but again, we're processing that food waste and, you know, it, um, again, and then come springtime, you know, your, your window of selling compost is usually about from March until the beginning of June, and then it stops. So you gotta move a lot of material in a short period of time. So, mm -hmm. which is also construction season maybe you know so yeah. there's a benefit there um and i'm glad um, mary allen mentioned uh that there is a newly developed illinois task force for that's creating a state solid waste and diversion plan um for those of us who aren't aware of it and want to learn more you know mary i'm going to ask that you send me something for the layman in in the room you know, I know about it because a lot of Illinois Food Scrap Coalition board members are involved in that. Josh, I think you might be um, part of that plan creation, but you know, how do we all uh, speak to what should be, you know, uh, part of that plan or how do we tell, you know, when does it get to the point of telling our legislators that we believe in that plan and want their support of it? You know, I think the Illinois Environmental Council, which side note, starting at noon today and every day, does free lunch and learns for everybody. And uh, Chicago Sustainability Task Force is a recent, recently joined member of the Illinois Environmental Council. They just know this kind of stuff and they are who we turn to, to find out how policy is moving. And they are, I mean, Illinois is so fortunate to have such a progressive team to, to contact who's out there lobbying for good versus other. Um, so I want to just kind of put that out there. We really just have a few minutes left. So um, I, I want to go ahead and share my screen again, just to provide this page that has um, a list of how to 
learn more, stay in touch, get involved with the Chicago Sustainability Task Force. Um, there's the website, Facebook, LinkedIn, Eco at Brightbeat is, so we kind of moderate and manage the task force for lack of a better term. So if you reach out to us, we'll get, um, get in a hold of you and answer your questions or whatever it may be. Um, so the kind of, I think the final, the final word that I want to, to leave everybody with is that we're talking and you know, if that doesn't happen, nothing's gonna happen. And I think that we're seeing more and more of our large institutions really stepping up. That's been happening. I mean, Loyola, Northwestern, UIC, you know, you guys are doing just exceptional work. And then we've got, you know, people like Midwest Foods. I mean, Alex, I can't say enough good things that I've learned since I've met you to just see that, you know, the ones who are generating all of this, what are you doing? There's grocers out there that are, that are um, launching some pilot programs to start composting in a, in a broader way. Phil and Organics is already working with a lot of those. I mean, we do need to be focused in how we tackle this problem. And that's really why the Chicago Sustainability Task Force formed was, okay, other folks that have big problems, how can we work together to solve them? And so I hope that this isn't the last conversation on this. Um, again, everyone who registered for this and all of you 50 people who are still on, I think we had 60 at the start, um, you will receive our notes. Thanks to Laura and Katie for taking those. And um, I just encourage you to stay in touch on this. I think there's been enough of an interest in having those who produce the materials. You know, Wendell from BPI really didn't speak, but thanks for being here and hearing what's going on. Um, you know, those who certify, they're not trying to sell a product. They're trying to make this system work better. And so I think it's, it's a matter of getting the manufacturers, the haulers, the um, certifiers all together, and then, as a unified voice really speaking to our legislators to make things uh, improve. So I'm gonna stop it there. The line's open for uh, a couple more minutes if anyone wants to share. Um, and again, um, I just really thank you guys all for caring about this and speaking up. Oh, and uh, in the chat, Lisa from UIC and her daughter, Lucy, mentioned that they have an event going on and they are screening the story of plastic for free. So if you go to sustainability.uic.edu, you should be able to find it, um, slash events, slash the story of plastic. But it's a great movie. We know the guy who, um, who created it. He actually helped us um, speak to city council on legislating the plastic ban reduction ordinance in Chicago. So, so kudos uh, to him and all of you. Again, I'll leave the line open for a minute, but uh, we're signing off. So, so thank you very much. So oh, just um, if you sign up to watch the film, you have to um, come to our discussion on Earth Day to help us think about how to reduce plastics. That's the only catch. Hey, Stephanie, can I say one thing? Go for it. Hi, this is Wendell from BPI. I've been listening and I just want to say thank you so much to Stephanie and also to Phil and Josh. Um, these conversations around compostable products um, can sometimes not be so fun, but it's it's not the job of the composter and the hauler to solve this problem. I just wanna make that very clear. Um, it's the job of the compostable products industry to give um, haulers and composters something that they can work with, right? The whole point of compostable products is for them to help facilitate the dispersion of food waste. And if those products aren't breaking down or if they're coming with extra contaminants or operational issues, then the products themselves aren't able to, to deliver on their mission and their reason for existing. And so we've got to fix that. Um, and so the, the place to start, if there's a desire to, is around testing. And um, Phil, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna reach out to you separately and um, just let you know of some resources on that front, because obviously you're not the only one expressing the things that you're expressing here and so what we're, right. trying, we're trying to do is is work with everyone and figure out figure out what's really going on here right the question that i asked was is it really about the rate of, of 
products breaking down or is it really about so many things that are actually not compostable making it in it sounds to me like you've got all of the issues going on right um and so you know we got to just start working on it so i just want to say thank you again and make sure that you guys didn't feel too much like you were in the hot seat in this <laughs> conversation because that's not that's not fair right these guys are showing up with the infrastructure pieces and it's up to the compostable products industry to be able to give them something that works in their system so thank you yeah thanks guys I don't know, and we're gonna have a we're gonna have a tour, you know, when things calm down. So I hope everyone's safe and healthy. Nice to see your smiling faces, Wendell. It's been like ten years, um, and okay. Pete, thank you for the. I'm exaggerating, but Pete, thank you very much for your document that you created. It looks great, and and Benjamin, I see you were gonna share a photo. Sorry, just with everything going on, we weren't able to do that. Um, I and for those of you still listening, Mary's mentioned to us April thirtieth from one to three is the um, IEPA-led Illinois Solid Waste Plan Update Task Force meeting. I know I'm gonna be there, so we'll make sure to, to share out um, a reminder on that to everyone who was a part of this. So thank you so much, Mary. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Thanks, you Stephanie. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Gosh. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Carter. <laughs> this is great. Thank you. Uh,